the operative word in this moment in history is fear. Everywhere you go, anybody you talk to for a while, they'll begin to express fear. So around us, there are all kind of signs of warning that express fear, just this kind of thing. Look at it. Breaking news. Traffic is busier than usual today, so expect delays with all the major highways. An organized area of low pressure, this could become a tropical depression and could become our next hurricane in the coming days. Warning signs wherever you go. Fear. Fear. Why so much fear? at this moment of time, especially and particularly in the United States? Big question. 1800 to 1600 BC, before Christ. Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world and the most affluent nation, so people were always attacking them, trying to overtake them, to take their goods, and so they built a strong military until finally they had defeated all possible enemies and there was peace. But the leaders in Egypt, the pharaohs, the emperors, the kings, discovered that unless the people were filled with fear, they could not continually control them and rule over them. So they incorporated fear by rumor, by innuendo, so they could stay in power because they knew a people that is surrounded by fear keep the leadership in place out of fear of total devastation. Now, we at this moment in history, most of us see our nation being turned upside down, or some people would say right side up. It depends upon your ideology. But we can easily see what is going on. I've listed a group of things that's not exhaustive. And as I address each one, I will not be exhaustive. But let's just look at some of the things that are causing fear in the lives of so many of us. First of all, there's the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't just keep printing money, printing money, printing money, borrowing money from China and not be a nation that ends up in bankruptcy. That's true anywhere, everywhere, all times, all place, in basic economics. <laughs> Two trillion, three trillion, six trillion. Or does it stop? By the way, <laughs> don't tell Washington what comes after a trillion, would you? <laughs> does anybody know? Raise your hand. What comes after a trillion? What is it? Quadrillion. A quadrillion is a thousand trillion. We'll be there in a little while the way we're going. So you say we have an economy now that wants to pay more and more and more people so they won't have to work. And when that happens, more and more more people are paid by the federal government and do not have to work. All of a sudden, there are jobs everywhere. And said, why go to work when... I can be sustained and supported by the federal government. And when you're supported by the federal government, guess what? Man, they've got you. You belong to them. And you get all the illegals who are coming in here, we'll talk about that in a minute, by the countless millions, and they all are supported by the federal government. My goodness, you are buying, buying votes left and right and you are destroying the economy 
of our land. The question is, why? Education. All of a sudden, the curriculum we have from kindergarten all the way through high school, it has already been in our college and universities of postmodernism. What does that mean? There's no absolute truths. There's nothing you can stand on. Whatever you think is true is true. You have your truth. I have my truth. Your truth is just as valid as my truth. And therefore, we have an educational system that is in shambles. And here is a student who goes to a college or a university, and they're so excited. I remember you went there. You got your curriculum. You got your books. Use books if you're smart. And in those days, now computers is even better. And you get enrolled. You have your class. You're there first semester, second semester, third, fourth semester, fifth, sixth semester, seventh, eighth semester. Finally, you've written papers, you've read, you've researched, you've talked, you've dialogued, you've taken all kinds of courses, and finally you reach the point you have enough to graduate, and you go to the platform. And there stands, if you're a small school, the president, a larger school, the, the dean of your college, and you go there, and you have your cap and gown, your mortar boards, you got all that on, and you go there, and he reaches and shakes your hand and says, I'm giving you a degree on opinions. <laughs> Is that all I have? Yes, you have a degree on opinions. There's nothing particularly nailed down. There's no absolutes. There's nothing I have really learned that will be applicable in the real life that I now am going to have. No, your degree is one on opinions. Education. Shambles. Hold your approach. Why? Borders. We've talked about that. A country without borders, think about it. A couple of million have come in, a few months. Probably more than that that just escaped, went through the net. And now when they come, those who've been there tell me the procedure is if you see someone come over, you get their name, who knows what that is really, and a little information, and you give them a bus ticket. That's how it works, a bus ticket. And we talk about the children who are coming. I've inquired about that. There are some little children who are unaccompanied, but the primary group of children are 14 to 17 to 21. Who knows their age? And what's happening in Central and South America, they have literally emptied their prisons. They've taken all of their gangs and undesirables, and they have paid for it through coyotes, through different things, and ship them all to America with that open door that we have down there, and then they're permeating our society today. Therefore, we have crime. I just had someone work up on the Internet. I don't do Internet. And I said, list all the statistics of crime in all across America in the past two years, and it will frighten you to death. In our own area, crime is work, murder, armed robbery, kidnapping, rape, you name it. It is up 42% last year, and now we're already ahead of the murder rate for this, this year in which we find ourselves. Why? Because all of these who are coming, and they're coming from a criminal background, from a gang background, MS-13, et cetera. They can't get a job. What are they going to do? They're going to do what they've always done. And therefore, we have a crime explosion that we've never seen before right here where you and I live and all across the country. The question is, why would this be allowed to happen? Why? Why the economy? Why education? Why the borders? And what about ballots? Listen, let me say very, very clearly to everybody, I encourage everyone who is a citizen of this land to vote. That is an endowed right that we have. But I want every citizen to vote one time, and I want their citizenship to be 
maintained by signature or by an identification so we'll have honest ballots and we can say that person was really elected and we'll know that it is valid. Why is this idea that anybody, anywhere, anytime, any way, with any kind of ballot, I can accumulate ballots of those who don't, why is this idea that we just have sort of a whosoever will? Has anybody ever gone to a foreign country and voted in that country? Would you lift your hand if you're a citizen? You don't do that, do you? But in America, with this kind of total liberalized voting, we become no different than China or Russia. They vote all the time, folks. But the leadership stays in through fear. Why? Why? Why would we allow this to happen? In our land, or the possibility of it happening. Why? The ballot. In the family, there's a concerted effort to break down the nuclear family. What's the nuclear family? A man and a woman married with children, the nuclear family. Now the family has been totally redefined. We'll be dealing right in the chapters to come. Totally redefined. Why? If you knew anything about Das Kapital, you knew anything about Karl Marx, you would know that he advocated in the move to socialism and Marxism and communism, you destroy the nuclear family, and that's the first step of leading no one to own any property in and of themselves. It immediately moves into the property area. That is a strategy of communism classically throughout history. No one owns property. Break up the nuclear family. What about the church? By the way, when I say church, I'm talking about the evangelical church. Most of the quote church, end quote church, has already sold out on almost every moral question. They've already put the white flag up a long time ago. So they're not in jeopardy. But those that stand on biblical truth, Last week in Canada, the Senate of Canada passed a bill that says that any religious book, i.e. the Bible, who states moral principles, they are liable and they have committed a crime and can spend up to two years in prison, federal prison in Canada. Now, let me read exactly an interpretation of that bill. It's Canadian hate speech bill, or somebody speaks and supports a moral principle in the Bible. It's hate speech. And here's what it says. These rulings display the secularist ideology of government leaders who don't mind people who, listen, believe in a religion as long as they don't act on it or teach it. <laughs> Folks, we can believe anything we want to believe. Just don't live it out and don't teach it, and you'll not be indicted by the law in Canada. If I have read a more ridiculous, laughable statement in my life, I can't remember it. Hate speech. It's wrong for a husband and wife to pretend to be a husband and wife and live together and not be married. That's hate speech in Canada. LBGTQ, hate speech. Two years, bang. I'm sad to say this. I hope I'm wrong. But I think a bill like that, much like that, would pass the U.S. House of Representatives as quick as zigzag lightning. I hope that is not true. Why? Religious liberty, gone. Why? Police. Let me say right up front, I support the people who wear the blue. You can book it.
What's happening to the police all across our land? First of all, in New York and Colorado, and another bill is before another state, it may be New Mexico, I'm not sure, and they're making every policeman liable for individual lawsuits against them as they seek to apprehend those who are breaking the law. Did you get that? Over 9,500 policemen in New York have resigned or quit in the last few months because you can't exist as a law enforcement officer when you arrest me and maybe you put handcuffs on me and I, oh, you have scarred my wrist. I need an attorney and their attorneys lined up to take my case to sue that policeman. You can't function. You can't support the law in that kind of environment. This is passing all the way through to defund the police, to have fewer and fewer policemen. And where the police are needed more than any other place is in the minority areas where there's so much anarchy going on today. You need more and more, not less, who are willing to really have the power to enforce the law. Why? Why? Crime rampant. Why? And I could extend this list on and on and on and on again, but I can tell you why. I've asked this question to all kinds of people and all kinds of walks of life. Why would the federal government support, cheer this kind of situation? And by the way, if you heard the Presidential address, a State of the Union. And by the way, 73 fewer people heard that address than the address that took place with the last president. 73 fewer people watched percent than they did before. In that address, you know what he said? A lot of things, but he said, all 27 amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, are not dogmatic they can be redefined, in other words, or taken out, all 27 of them. Already, the Constitution has been shredded, and its interpretation with postmodernism, it can mean anything you want it to mean, and now the amendments, we say, they're all up for grabs. So those foundational documents upon which we stand, what's going on? Why? Why? Why all this fear? Why all this seeking for more and more of power? And we call it what it is. Why? To create chaos. There can be no other logical explanation. If you've got one, please tell me soon. I want to hear it from anybody who's moderately intelligent. Is there any other reason for all of this? And everywhere you look, it's to create chaos. And in the midst of chaos, the police can't protect us. The economy is gone. I can't buy gas. I don't have food enough to eat. Check out Venezuela once again one of the most prosperous nation in the Western Hemisphere just a couple of handful of years ago, and now you've got miles of line, and the average income is $3 a month. There's no medicines. There's no privation. Over 5 million people have left in the last six months or so. They don't have oil or gas, and under them is some of those rich deposits of natural energy anywhere in the world Chaos. Chaos. This is the formula. This is the only reason I can see for this going on in the United States. And what happens in chaos? I need protection. The police aren't here. Send some of the federal officers to protect me. Desperation. I can't eat. Send me some federal funds so I can have money to eat. I, I can't pay for the gas. And by the way, gas now is higher in most states than it's been in recent history. I can't pay. Send me some money. And all of a sudden, we're all dependent on the government. And what has happened, instead of being one nation under God, we're one nation under 
the state. And it's not in God we trust. It is in the state we trust. And we know that evangelical Christians... 99% of them wrote the foundational doctrines of our land, the Constitution, etc. And therefore, we are founded as a nation of freedom, independence, individuality, not groups. And now, all of a sudden, there is chaos, and we have to look to the federal government, and more and more millions and millions become dependent upon them. Oh, yeah. That's what will happen. How do you know? It's happened every single time in history. No exceptions. Chaos. The feds have to come in and control. Fear. They come in control. What is the answer to this? Corinthians was much like this. Corinthians was a Society that was governed by the emperor. Caesar was in charge. He was a despot. He went down and said, hey, send me your taxes. Shut up, be quiet. Send me your taxes. And in Corinth, there was anarchy. What is anarchy? There's no authority. There's no authority. Read the last verse in the book of Judges. There was no king in the land, no authority, Therefore, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. That is anarchy. When that happens, you say, oh, federal government, come and help us. We've run out of bullets. God, our foundational documents, replaced by the all-powerful state. Corinth was in shambles, crisis. Their whole system, immorality, people from all over the world, divided by language and groups and economics, major port, super affluence, crime, raging, their justice system. Did you know in Corinth in the first century, many juries, juries were numbered 1,000 people? Some juries had 6,000 people in a case. Think about that. A jury of 6,000 people. You say, why in the world? The state paid the jurors a certain amount of money to get on a jury. Man, I'll go do that in the morning. I'll be happy to sit there. You see what happens, folks? There's a whole history of this. In chaos, the state steps in and saves us all. The reason for all of this can be no other rational explanation but to create fear and chaos and ultimately say, man, there's an ideology now that controls us. It is monolithic, and you do as I say. Can't communicate. Words and history are redefined. That's where we are. What's the answer? 1 Corinthians, that's the answer. The answer that God gave to the church in Corinth is the answer he gives to us as the church. We've already said that those in Corinth, you couldn't tell the non-Christians from the Christians. And now Paul has come, and he's already established if we studied this book. This is who you are, and this is what you have. And now he says, this is what you do. And he begins with a semblance of authority. And he simply says, guess what? In your situation, Corinth, Father knows best. Look at it, verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you, my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers, only one. For Jesus Christ In Jesus Christ, I became your father in the gospel. Father knows best. He's saying, I introduce you to Jesus Christ of the gospel. What is the gospel? Simply stated, it's two things. It's grace 
That's a big part of the gospel. And it's truth. That's a big part of the gospel, isn't it? Now, if you have grace and truth, you have a new life, you have Christ. If you only have grace, you have license. You have liberal. Well, I can do anything, say anything. It doesn't matter. God's going to forgive me. I'll live the life. I'll control my own life. You have license. If you only have truth, you have legalism. Don't do this. Don't do that. So you got to have grace. You got to have truth. And they go together. If you lose one and one is stolen away, you don't have a life in Christ. You don't have the gospel. So Paul said, I came and gave you grace and truth, and I am the Father. I am the Father. And he's talking about authority. Now, most of us don't like authority, but we cannot live without authority. Everybody lives under some kind of authority. That is, there's a difference from being under an authority and a difference from authoritarianism. Totally different. Paul says, I come as a father with a father's authority, and we step under the father, and the father is God Almighty himself. Is this book over here, the Bible? It is a book of authority, or as some would say, it is a book of authoritarianism. In other words, you go to the Bible, is it authoritarianism? Don't do this, do this, live like this, live like that, and you're bound up? Is that the Bible? No. The Bible is a book of authority. What's the difference? Someone who has a position of authority, how do they operate? They say, I have a responsibility of leadership over this group of people, and I want input from all those people. I want to make sure we agree on the same goal, and I want you to agree on this is what our goal is, and this is where together we decided we're going to get there, and we're going to use everybody's input we have, everybody's gifts that we have to reach that goal. Authority. How does that function in the church? How does that operate in the body of Christ? It's simply saying our authority is the book and we're under the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, together we seek a goal. What is that goal? Glorify God. Enjoy him forever. Glorify God. How do you do that? Enjoy him forever. How do you do that? We begin to fulfill the Great Commission. We go and make disciples and we teach. We make and we teach. We make and we teach under the authority. And everybody is a part of it. That is true authority, biblical authority. And authoritarianism comes when somebody says, hey, huh, I, I'm in charge here. You do that. You go over there. That doesn't work. No, you're exed out. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to take your job. No, no, no. I'm in charge. That's authoritarianism. Big difference. This book the Lord Christ, we're under his authority, but it's not a sense of author authoritarianism. You do like I do. Paul wouldn't come and say, I'm your father. I want you to know. Any father in any household tries to run their household like that, you're an abject failure before you start. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There's nothing this nation needs more than in the family there to be God-fearing fathers who are lovers and leaders in that family. Nothing would change America if that would take place. How does it work? Authority. If you have a symphony orchestra, everybody's gifted. They have their own talent. Some of them are so, they're so trained and gifted in, in all the instrumentality, but they have a score Let's say we're going to present the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, Symphony, and you have a score in the orchestra, and you have a conductor, and everybody plays their part, and the conductor gets to interpret how this symphony will be presented. You can't have any outliers. You can't have a flute player stand up, you know, taking off on their own, but it's, we have a score, that's the book. We have a conductor that is the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ, and boy, when all of that works together, you have a beautiful presentation. You see, that's how authority operates. 
And a father sees a child in a bicycle riding against the traffic. The father goes out, asserts authority, and rescues that child and brings that child into a safe place. Well, that's too authoritative. No, sometimes authority exercises discipline and restraint. How do you bring up a child? A colt is born. For all of you who don't know, that's a little horse. It's born as a stall. For a while, that colt stays in that stall with his mom, right? And then finally, the colt goows out and gets to go in the barn. Then the colt matures, they, they put the colt in the corral. And the colt grows up, they open the gate, and he's in the pasture. Has to be restraints there as the colt grows and matures under the instruction of the person in charge, the authority, position of a father. And when the colt gets out in the field, still there's a fence out there, and hopefully it's built into them because the father and the situation had built in certain disciplines in that animal, and we're to build in certain disciplines in our kids. Father. Father should know best. And then Paul says an amazing thing here, and he says that God says that to us today. He says, this, this is staggering. Verse 16, therefore I exhort you to imitate me, imitate the Father. You know, we tell our kids, now, son, I don't want you to be like me. I want you, uh -huh. I don't want you to, you know, I, I, how many fathers say, hey, dad, take kids? You be like me. You be like me. By the way, our kids do what we require them to do till they get to be about twelve or thirteen, and then have you noticed they begin to begin to live like we live? Have you noticed that? So we have that time of love and incubation and, and training and, and discipline to build those basic stuff in their lives that's going to make a difference. You say, be an imitator of me, Father. George Washington was the father of our country. Why? He wasn't very talented. Do you know that? Read his biography. Uh, he wasn't very smart. In fact, of all the contemporaries of General Washington, the father of our country, he couldn't even compete in any area of leadership or knowledge or experience with, with, with Franklin or Madison or, or Hamilton or Jefferson. He, George Washington was not in their league intellectually or experientially. No way. I've read the biographies of all of them. He, he, he was inferior in a lot of ways. But my goodness, he was general of the army. Whoa. My goodness, he presided over the Constitutional Convention, my goodness. He's elected our first president a couple of terms, and everybody wanted to make him king. You mean to tell me all these contemporaries that we know, our forefathers, had more stuff and ability and talent than Washington? By a million miles they did, by any estimation. What did Washington have? George III of England, his protagonist, said, Washington is most unusual. He said he is the only leader who was offered more power than he had, and he continually turned it down to have lesser power. Know anybody like that? Huh. Washington, one, two, three, maybe four times, had offered more power. He could have been elected king without any question. He didn't do it. Why? He gave power away. He backed up from power. And that's why those brilliant forefathers trusted him with power. Be imitators of me, Paul said the role of a father. And he said, the church is still messed up. The culture is still messed up. He said, I'm going to send you help. Thank goodness. And he says, first of all, verse 17, for this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways, said Paul, which are in Christ, 
just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. He said, I'm going to send Timothy to you. He's my right hand. He's my son. He will come and tell you exactly what the ABCs of Christianity is all about and how we are to then live if we're men and women who are truly in Christ. And he said, he's going to come humbly and he's going to bring you up to speed as to what it means to be a servant within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he's going to come to you. And then Paul said, by the way, I'm going to come too. Oh, my goodness. He said, but I will come to you soon at the Lord's will. I will find out not the words of those who are arrogant. I'm going to find out those who really have power. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, what is it? Jesus said, I have brought to you the kingdom. Draw a circle. Stand in the middle of the circle. If you in the middle of that circle, Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, there is the kingdom of God right there. Already. The kingdom has come in Christ in your life and in my life already. There is the kingdom of God. It is already, but it is, remember, not yet. The kingdom is already, but not yet. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That's the second coming of Christ. But then he says, thy will be done on earth right now as things operate in heaven. Because remember, this new heaven and new earth will be heaven one day right here in a pristine recreation. We know that, but we pray that his will, his purposes will be accomplished now with kingdom men and women and young people who are living in the kingdom, which is right now, yet not yet until he comes and brings down the curtain of history. It's already, it's not yet. And he says, I'm going to come and see all of those who are in the church who are so arrogant who are redefining morality, redefining what it means to be a disciple of Christ. He says, I'm going to see if they're just windbags, Hebrew word, windbags, bullhards, arrogant, or I'm going to see if they got power that goes with the kingdom. He said, I'm going to come. And then he says, I can come to you in two ways. I love this last verse of the fourth chapter. Paul says, then what are you to desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He said, I can come to you as an authoritarian, and I can straighten out all this trash and junk and immorality and lawsuits and, and all the rest that's going on in your relationship. I can come with authoritarianism and say, this is what you do, and this is what you don't do. He said, I can come with authoritarianism, or he says, I can come like a father, with authority, but with love. Let's get practical. What do we do as Christians, the church, the body of Christ in the world today? How do we confront all the chaos all the fear that we have. Hmm. Just take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to me to 1 John. Turn right, or go to the end of the Bible, turn left, and read a passage in the fourth chapter of 1 John 17. He says, by this, Love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. Listen, there is no fear. That's what we started in. There's no fear in love. But perfect love, that's Christ, cast out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love we love because he first loved us. Boy, in our confused, broken culture, 
you know, what, what do we do? What do we use? And then I thought of another passage, John 13, Jesus. Jesus is saying in verse 3, by the way, have you ever wondered, theologians have for years, Jesus was God and he was man, right? Totally God, holy man. If he were totally God all the time, his whole life would be a sham, wouldn't it? He'd omnipotent, omniscient, knowing it would be a sham. If he were totally God. If he were totally man in his earthly life, had no divinity there. How did all these miracles? So, so you've got a, a blending of God, man, God, man, and Jesus of Nazareth. And that is a mystery. And if we understood it clearly, we'd be God. But there it is. But we know that Jesus did not exercise his infinite knowledge and infinite power because I don't think he knew he had it until we read in this verse, John 13, it says, Jesus, verse 3, knowing that his Father had given him all things unto his hands, that he had come forth from God, he was going back to God. At this moment in his life, Jesus knew he had all the power, all the power of Almighty God. You think that is enough power to handle anything? All the power of God, he said, it was in his hands. And what did he do with it? Well, he could have called down lightning and destroyed the Roman Empire. Bip, no big deal, couldn't he? All power. Man, he, he could have split the Atlantic Ocean or taken, the, I don't know, Mount Sinai and, and moved it to uh, Palestine, Texas. He had all power. Bang, no big deal. Called 10,000 angels, 10 million, no big deal. He had all power. What did he do with it? Well, next verses tell us he rolled his sleeves up, got a basin, water, poured water in it, towel over his arms. Wash the feet, the dirty feet, including the feet of Jesus, including the feet of Judas. Jesus washed their feet, and he had all power. He exercised love. Because in just a couple of three, a handful of hours after this, he who had all power all power was nailed to a cross and died because of love of you and me so that we might have life now and life everlasting. So his power was manifested in love, the most powerful thing ever in the world. <laughs> love is not just mushy, Feelings. Love is something you do. It employs discipline. It employs a lot of different facets, but it is that love that we must use as we begin to be that counterforce in the culture in which we live. There's nothing more powerful than that. Let me tell you something. Where do you begin? Right here. Where do you begin? I want everybody to point you to yourself. Would you, 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 you don't mind that. Just, would you, everybody do me a courtesy. Everybody point you to yourself. Everybody, all the way in the wings. Would you just point it up? Would everybody do that? Some are not doing it. It's not too hard. <laughs> Turn like everybody point to yourself. Good. That's where we begin. I begin there. Dear Lord God Almighty, you know, make me a new person. Continue to let me grow up and teach me how to be a a lover in this world, whatever it calls the love in this world. Let me tell you, when that happens in your life and in my life, I say this theologically, it scares the hell out of the enemy. Yeah. 
when someone stands up, I give myself to Christ. I want to love the world through my life. Boy, that's powerful. And then the next thing you do is you go and build. Remember, I've talked about it over and over again. If we worship narrowly every day, quiet time with God, Christ, when we come here and worship widely, corporately in church, if all of us have worshiped and listened to God and prayed to God, whatever the time frame every day, when we come here, we worship narrowly, and then we worship broadly. There is power in that, and it begins with the structure of the family. The family. The family. The Father knows best. The family. The Father leads and loves and the wife, the children, a family of one, the family of 21. There's power there in a family. And when a family does that, as individuals do that, love. I say it theologically and biblically, it scares the hell out of the lost and confused world. Billy Graham was preaching in uh, London, thousands coming to Christ. The London Times had to say something, and they said, Billy Graham coming to London with his powerful crusades have set England back to the 1900s. They asked Graham about that. He said, boy, I sure made a mistake. I wanted to set England back to the first century. A family, an individual responding to the reception of God's love, a man, a woman in Christ living in this world as a true powerful lover. And in the family, most powerful thing countercultural lifestyles can do individually and in the family. <laughs> 